Good evening. Welcome to this panel discussion on the Baltic after Brexit. It's hosted by the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. And I'd just like to begin by thanking Professor Brendan Sims and his colleagues at the Centre for putting this together. It's the fifth in this Baltic geopolitical programme series. We've had a lot of interest and I'm delighted to say that with our colleagues in the network of universities in the region, we're now building a substantial programme of events and activities and a regular newsletter. This evening, 168 people have registered for the event, which we're very pleased about. This evening is an online video panel. We'll end at 1800, 6 p.m. UK time promptly. I will moderate a discussion with the panelists for the first half hour. And then in the second half, I will relay questions from the audience, from you, to our panelists. You as the audience will be able to see and hear me and the panelists. You will have your microphone and camera switched off automatically. So at no time will you be heard or seen by anyone in this webinar. However, you're still able to communicate with me and everybody else. At the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A option. Click on it, and when it opens, you have the chance to type questions. If you type questions, please start by writing your name and your affiliation first. If your question is for a particular panellist, please state that at the outset as well. I will try to cover as many of your questions as possible, though in view of these numbers and time constraints, we not, might not be able to address everyone's questions. Finally, I need to let you know that this video panel is being recorded and we will post the recording on our website over the next day or so. So as I say, what we're talking about this evening is the Baltic after Brexit. The momentous events of the past few years have had enormous implications for the Baltic region and for Britain's role there. Noting its historically important role in the region, our panel will ask whether the UK will be able to sustain its role into the future, and if so, in what ways. The critical part played by the UK in deterring Russian aggression through NATO might come under increased strain, especially if the eventual form of Brexit leads the EU, including Poland and the Baltic states, to tilt against the UK for any reason, commercial trade or whatever. In the context of the changes in American politics, at least under former President Trump, away from the Article 5 commitment to her NATO allies, we explore whether the region might become more dependent on London, so reverting to historical geopolitical patterns, or will London become more dependent on the region? We've got a distinguished panel of speakers to discuss these questions. I'm going to ask each of them to make a presentation of five to seven minutes, then when those three presentations have been done, we'll move to general discussion. Our three panellists this evening are Dr. Maria Melksu. She's at the moment in a village called Grimbergen, just near Brussels, where she works, which she tells me is a good beer producing place. I don't know if she's going to enjoy it later afterwards. She'll be followed by General Sir Richard Sheriff, who's in his house on Salisbury Plain, uh, a beautiful part of England. And Anna Wies Wieslander, the third of our uh, participants, panellist, is in Stockholm, where she says we've got new fresh snow arrived this evening and so that uh, it's an excitement there. I'll give a bit more of an introduction to each of them as I go through but just to explain how we'll organise it the first presentation from Maria will be about what are the security issues in the Baltic today. The second from Richard will be what he thinks are Russia's ambitions in, in situation in addressing this position in the Baltic and the third from Anna will be about NATO and European Union attitudes and Baltic country attitudes and how well they can work together in this process. So that's what our first three uh, presentations will address. As I say, the first is on the security issues in the Baltic and Maria Melksu is going to introduce it. She is a senior lecturer and director of research and ethics at the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies. She did her PhD at Cambridge University and then was a senior researcher at the University of Tartu in her native Estonia. She has policy experience in practice from the Estonian Minister of Defence, the International Centre for Defence Studies in Tallinn and the Office of the President of Estonia. Her research covers social theoretic perspectives of the European Union and NATO's strategic developments. She wrote The Politics of Becoming European, 
a study of Polish and Baltic post-Cold War security imaginaries, and her most recent article is on NATO's enhanced forward presence. Maria, we're delighted you've agreed to participate today, and we very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much, Charles, and thank you for the invitation. Good evening, everybody. Of course, the way the problem is posed reminded me immediately of uh, the late Estonian President Lennart Meri and his remarks in 1996 uh, at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, where he said that uh, you know the, the issue for Estonia is security, security, and security. So what kind of security or insecurity space is the Eastern Baltic space today? And what are the contemporary security dilemmas then in the region? What is NATO's dilemma in the Baltic states and by extension, the United Kingdoms as the leader of NATO's enhanced forward presence multinational battle group in Estonia, that is the northernmost of the three Baltic states. I would suggest that the Baltic states are pretty obviously back as the touchstone of NATO's credibility in Eastern Europe. Once depicted as the litmus test of NATO's post-Cold War Eastern enlargement strategy, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania are now at the heart of NATO's back to the basics agenda, if you will, namely the reanimation of NATO's deterrent profile towards Russia's political and military ambitions in the northeastern fringes of Europe. NATO's military footprint in the Baltics and Poland is, of course, quite unprecedented today with this enhanced forward presence, which was introduced in the region after Russia's annexation of Crimea and the war in Ukraine. It's perhaps worth recalling that back at the time of the Russia-Georgia war of 2008, NATO did not actually have uh, contingency plans for defending its newest members. So this situation is palpably different today we have the rotational battle groups placed in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland as allied forward presence, even though, of course, critics question whether NATO's tripwire forces in the Eastern Baltic space are actually sufficient to dissuade Russia's potential adventurism and de facto military supremacy in the region. So I would say that uh, this eastern flank of the alliance, of which the Baltic states are, of course, a crucial part, has emerged as a new ritual space in the strategic debates over the major geopolitical challenges of deterring and defending against Russia in the post-Crimea strategic environment. We see how the Fulda gap of the Cold War years uh, has now been replaced with a Suwalki gap, a narrow land strip between Poland and Lithuania that could serve as a key transit corridor for allied forces for delivering military aid to the Baltic states in a crisis. Uh, I, I already mentioned the enhanced forward presence. This is part of the general um, boosting of the deterrence and defense posture of NATO post-2014 uh, in the region, which was formerly militarily, I wouldn't say maybe neglected, but certainly less substantiated in terms of the deterrent than it is now. Uh, NATO also further tightened uh, its uh, security relationship with Finland and Sweden to buttress the situation in the Baltic Sea post-2014 and, and agreed on a readiness action plan at the Alliance's Wales Summit of 2014. Now, for the Baltic states, I would say the main challenge still continues to be about finding an optimal balance between maximizing their physical sense of security yet not developing a tunnel vision or getting bogged down by their constant anxiety over living a tad too close for comfort to their intensely status conscious and status hungry Eastern neighbor. So the Baltic security dilemma in a nutshell is one of balancing their entangled physical and ontological security concerns. And of course, this dilemma is not unique to the Baltic states. Uh, but it's certainly one that is intensified uh, by the geopolitical positioning of the Baltic Three, and it is further magnified by Estonia's and Latvia's demographic compositions. The Baltic states are not alien to what has been described as the existential uncertainty of small peoples. But I think it's very important also to acknowledge for the Baltic states that this mentality of frontline states in a potential conflict between NATO and Russia can also be paralyzing for the democratic debate over which values are worth persisting for, 
And this is the kind of constant reflection and self-probing, I would argue, any democratic political community constantly needs to submit itself to in order not to forget the positive content of statehood and sovereignty. You know, what are they for and not just what are they from or against to. Now, let me now turn to NATO and its dilemma in the Baltic states. For the North Atlantic Alliance, the question uh, has always been whether NATO can possibly keep Russia relatively content or undisturbed with the fact that its former dependents have slipped away into the embrace of Russia's traditional rival, that is NATO, while meeting the security expectations of the Balts and maintaining its own relevance as a defensive deterrent alliance concurrently. And of course, you know, it is a tricky thing to keep Russia relatively content. One, one is always reminded of uh, the sour remark by the former uh, Russian president Boris Yeltsin, when asked about his emotions uh, at NATO's enlargement to the Baltic states, he remarked something like, nobody cheers at the new marriage of their ex-wife. Um, today, Russia, of course, still enjoys territorial advantage in the Baltic space. It has the ability to overrun NATO defenses when denying access to any reinforcements that might arrive in time. Well, might many, of course, do question the likelihood of Russia's interest to conventionally challenge NATO in the Baltic states. The physical location and the lack of strategic depth of the Baltic states would still make them very difficult to defend by conventional means for NATO. We all know about these uh, Russian anti-access area uh, denial A2AD bubbles uh, that extend from you know, Kaliningrad, St. Petersburg, Belarus, um, and it's, it's, it remains a tough military nut to crack uh, faring against these integrated access denial systems, which is not, of course, helped by the intricacies of the Baltic geography, the fact that um, there is um, not significant strategic depth, let's put it this way. So Russia in military terms has an upper hand in the region. Luckily for NATO, you know, these things are not just reducible to, to the military supremacy. Now the jury is out uh, whether the costly signal of NATO's first ever continuous presence of combat capable forces from other allies in the region has a dissuading or perhaps rather a tempting effect on Russia's seeming readiness to test the alliance's resolve, which we've seen multiple times in multiple ways, also vis-a-vis -vis the Nordic uh, countries in recent years. While the Allied presence in the Baltic state certainly raises the cost of potential military aggression for Russia, it remains uh, rather symbolic in terms of um, its, its military weight um, it's, it's not sufficient in military terms, again. But obviously further major augmenting of NATO forces to the degree that would be needed for thwarting a theoretic full-scale Russian invasion in the region is, uh, again, problematic for all sorts of reasons and likely to encounter considerable opposition due to you know, the costs, uh, practical but obviously mostly political uh, reasons and political costs. And of course, the credibility of NATO deterrence remains ultimately in the eye of its targets. Against this backdrop, the Baltic states continue to be uh, the true litmus test for NATO as a deterring alliance. Now, my final point uh, in that regard uh, would be to suggest that the UK uh, would certainly remain a crucial European power in the region, regardless of, of Brexit and regardless of, of uh, what the nebulous um, concept of strategic uh, autonomy for Europe really means in substance, at least in the foreseeable future, as far as I can see. Historically, the Baltic states have counted on the United Kingdom as the supporter of small states and the UK's political, economic and military contribution to Baltic independence struggles at the tail end of the First World War are well known, of course. And I believe that a global Britain could certainly do worse than carrying on with its current frontline embeddedness in the historical meeting place of Western European and Russian political projects and, and spaces. The Baltic states in that turn, if we raise this question about their potential tilting against the UK, 
I don't believe they are in the position to be picky about their key allies with uh, whom they have built, uh, built also these, these uh, crucial bonds, for instance, in Afghanistan. Um, and they can't be picky about their allies having chosen to follow their hearts on, uh, on some issues, such as, you know, the Brexit Britain sailing its own way away from the EU. Um, so I do see the UK's position in the region as continuing uh, strong and sound, and I will stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Maria, thank you very, very much. That's a very stimulating and helpful introduction to the whole of this evening. Many thanks. Our second uh, panellist, who's going to talk about Russia's ambitions and situation, is General Sir Richard Sheriff. Richard is a retired, very senior British Army officer and also an author. After serving in the Gulf War in Northern Ireland, in Kosovo and Iraq, he finished his military career by serving as NATO's Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe from March 2011 to March 2014. He's had a very distinguished military career, observing these issues very closely in his practical life. So after he finished as uh, the uh, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe, he decided in 2017 to write the part fictional War with Russia, an urgent warning from senior military command to draw attention to his perceptions of the dangers of this kind of situation. And it follows very directly from what Maria has said to us about the dilemmas which NATO faces uh, to understand how Russia might be thinking about this. So Richard, we're delighted and thank you very much for participating this evening. And we very much look forward to what you're going to say to us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charles. And, uh, and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening and, and good evening to you all. Um, I, I start with the view that, that many commentators, myself included, view Russia under Putin as posing a serious threat in the Baltic, not only to NATO and its eastern flank allies, but also its close partners, Finland and Sweden. Russia has labelled NATO an adversary, developed a mix of capabilities to confront it, created and exercised offensive plans targeting the alliance, and continues to engage in provocative and irresponsible military behavior towards it. For example, regular incursions into allied airspace, dangerous overflights of allied warships, regular offensive exercise in the Baltic, direct, clearly directed at NATO and the Baltic states, and the use of a weapons grade nerve agent in the Salisbury poisoning. As we saw in 2008 and 2014, Russia has shown its willingness and ability to use military force or the threat of it to achieve its political objectives. And in the case of Ukraine, flagrantly violated the existing international order and fundamental principles of European security. To misquote Bismarck, Putin has brought the politics of iron and blood and guile back to Europe. He's also shown a taste for high risk opportunistic gambling and the ability time and again to surprise the West. So what does Putin want? Well, first, he wants to protect his own position. He wants to survive. And this means keeping his popularity ratings high. And to do this, he has to distract attention away from protesters like Navalny and economic hardship at home by the tried and tested way, foreign adventures which demonstrate Russia and Putin's strength. Next, he wants Russia recognized as a great power, a state which calls the shots and which evidently plays a major geopolitical pl a role in the world. And it's not done badly. Look at the way Russia has established itself as the major power broker in the fallout from the Syrian civil war. Not bad for a country which is inherently weak in many ways. Russia is also fearful about its vulnerabilities and the need to defend itself. So Putin wants to protect Russian interests by re-establishing Russian power in the former republics of the Soviet Union, the near abroad. A link to this is an emotional attachment. To many Russians, the Baltic states are almost seen as part of Russia. They were part of the Tsarist Empire, and of course, after World War II, the Soviet Empire. Putin sees NATO as a direct threat. So he seeks the neutralization or even the destruction of NATO. And this manifests, manifests itself in an obsession, almost a paranoia, with encirclement. I heard Steve Rosenberg, the BBC correspondent in Moscow, 
interviewing a Russian recently who claimed that NATO had 400 bases encircling Russia. Certainly senior Russian military are obsessed with NATO encirclement. And I remember a senior general telling me that a German logistic base in Uzbekistan to support the German effort in Northern Afghanistan during the ISAF mission proved that NATO's intent was to circle Russia. And neutralizing NATO means decoupling America from European defense, a very real possibility under the Trump administration. Indications thus far are more positive under President Biden. NATO is nothing without American leadership. Until Trump, the alliance could count on whatever president occupying the White House being prepared to come to the aid of a NATO member if attacked without any ifs or buts. If the doctrine of collective defense is to have any credibility, that state of affairs needs to be firmly reestablished. Certainly the 2014 invasion of Crimea and the start of the war in Ukraine kicked off a dynamic which could quite possibly put Russia on a collision course with NATO over the Baltic states, all of which of course are NATO members and two of which have significant Russian speaking minorities. Of course, Finland and Sweden are not immune from this threat either. And this is really dangerous because under Article 5, if Putin has a go at the Baltic states, every other member of NATO is treaty bound to fight for them. And this would be catastrophic, not least because the Russians integrate nuclear weapons into every aspect of their military thinking. Now, compared to where NATO was in 2014, I think the Alliance has generally responded pretty effectively. Certainly, there's recognition that the maintenance of the transatlantic peace we've all enjoyed for over 70 years depends on effective deterrence, a genuine belief in Russian minds that NATO will defend its land border, airspace and sea lines of communication. The question, though, remains, has the bar of risk been raised too high for Russia to consider any opportunistic move into the Baltic states or more widely within the Baltic area? Now, time precludes me from not from going into more detail about NATO, what NATO might be doing to raise the bar. But the bottom line is that Russia only respects strength. Remember Stalin's comment when told of the power of the Catholic Church. How many divisions has the Pope, he said. The, par, the bar has to be set so high that Putin thinks it's not worth to try. If it's not set high, he might just be tempted to have a go. But it also means dialogue. Russia is a great nation and we want to and we need to live with Russia. The last thing we need to do is to stumble into a catastrophe through misunderstanding. So deterrence must be backed by dialogue, but it mustn't be unconditional dialogue and it must be based on an acceptance of international law and the sovereign rights of Russia's neighbors to live as they want without interference. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much. That's a very sobering presentation uh, to lead into Anna Wieslander, who's going to deal with the NATO and e European attitudes on this question. Just to give a numerical point, I think I'm right in saying that of the nine countries uh, that surround the Baltic Sea, one is Russia and the other eight, both in either in EU or NATO, have to find a way to work together. Can they do that? Does Brexit make that more difficult? How does it operate? Nobody could better discuss these problems and difficulties than Anna. She's the director of Northern Europe of the Atlantic Council and chair of the Institute for Security and Development Policy, which is a think tank based in Stockholm. She has degrees from Gothenburg and Lund universities. From 1996 to 2003, she held various positions at the Swedish Defence Ministry, including secretary of the Swedish Defence Commission. And then from 2003 to 2008, she was head of the speaker's office at the Swedish Parliament. She's written extensively on the security of the Baltic Sea region. And in 2016, she wrote an article, NATO, the US and Baltic Sea Security. Anna, we look very forward, look, look forward very much to what you have to say this evening. And thank you very much for joining us. Anna Wieslander. Thank you so much, uh, Charles, for those kind words. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, and good evening, uh, everyone who is uh, listening and joining us uh, tonight. Um, I would like to focus my remarks. So many uh, interesting things have been uh, uh, already spotlighted here by 
Maria and Richard. Uh, so I would like to say a few, give a few points on the UK, uh, Brexit and institutional and uh, cooperative consequences for the Baltic Sea region. Uh, and first, uh, as, as we have understood here from previous speakers, uh, the Baltic Sea region is a region with, with a very high degree of security interdependence. It's uh, one military strategic area and uh, there is no escape from cooperating in order to deal with the security challenges should uh, the region face uh, such. And uh, therefore we can all see already now if we look at Brexit and the consequences that uh, the Britain is leaving the EU uh, there is no 100% overlap institutionally in the region. Uh, we already have uh, Norway not being a member of the EU, but a NATO member, uh, as pointed out by Richard. We have Sweden and Finland, uh, military non-aligned, not members of NATO, but members of the EU, working closely uh, regardless uh, with NATO on collective defense in exercises and training. We have Denmark, uh, who is uh, both a member of NATO and the EU, but does not participate in the security and defense cooperation of the EU, uh, and so on. And then uh, at the bottom line, we have uh, uh, the main guarantees for security in the region given by the United States, which is not actually not even on the continent. So uh, in, in this regard, uh, there is already, my point is that there is already pragmatic cooperation on the security in the region. I think this will continue uh, with the UK uh, also now uh, with Brexit. Uh, secondly, I would like to argue that the UK, as we have heard here, is firmly anchored in the, in the Baltic Sea region. It's fair to say uh, we have uh, initiatives uh, such as the Northern Group, uh, which uh, Defence Minister Fox took in 2010 uh, to kind of uh, create a forum informally uh, with the defence ministers uh, of the countries in Northern Europe, including in the Baltic Sea uh, region, and that has been ongoing since. We have the Joint Expeditionary Force um, launched in 2014. Uh, which is uh, a, a group of uh, a British general told me the beer drinking nations. I guess that's a bit of a joke, but still it says a focus on, on you know, like-minded nations cooperating, a, a, a force that is supposed to be deployable all over the world, but has naturally come to have a focus on uh, Baltic Sea and when uh, Defence Secretary then uh, Fallon was in Sweden and Finland in 2017 when Sweden and Finland joined the, uh, the Jeff, you know, he said that now Sweden and uh, Finland can consider themselves natural allies. Um, you know, we will not let these countries uh, stand alone if something happens. So. These, in addition to what Maria uh, explained, the enhanced forward presence, uh, the Baltic air policing and so on, being a NATO member, the UK is, is definitely in, in the Baltic Sea region. Still then, uh, Brexit, I think, can, causes concern for regional uh, actors with regard to the UK. And I would like to point out a few of those that we can uh, perhaps discuss some trends that we have seen as a consequence of, of uh, the Brexit decision in 2016. We have for the countries in the region a bit of a political pivot to, to Berlin. You can say Germany, an increased interest in uh, connecting more to Berlin. Uh, Berlin has traditionally not been oriented uh, north that much to be, to be fair, but has uh, assumed leadership for uh, the battle uh, for the enhanced forward presence in Lithuania, for instance, and, and engage much more in Baltic Sea uh, security issues lately. Uh, still um, at the beginning of this journey, I would say, but definitely more interesting now than a few years ago. Uh, secondly, the concern is, of course, a risk that the EU will go soft on Russia without the UK at the table. Uh, and I think uh, we could just see uh, the big discussion that uh, occurred after uh, High Representative Joseph Borrell's visit to Moscow 
a few weeks ago. He was warned in advance by the Baltic states and by Poland, Romania from going because he had mostly carrots and no sticks or not sufficiently enough of sticks. And, and they saw it was a risk of, of bad timing of him uh, going and he still went. Uh, and one can only speculate, would he have gone uh, if the UK had still been uh, a member? Um, but uh, there is definitely worries regarding this and the UK um, has a role to play there. There is a concern uh, thirdly on, on the notion of global Britain. What will this mean? We have the integrated review coming up next week. Um, we'll see where, where the consequences, um, how it will play out. Uh, ambitious for global Britain going you know, east of the Suez. Um, and then in addition, no formal agreement between the UK and the EU on security and defense. So those two factors uh, how will this play out? Um, I think here we can see the risk for as smaller nations around the Baltic Sea uh, depend a lot. If you're a small nation, you know, the institutions are important uh, because you have a say at the table uh, and um, the weakening of institutions that uh, Brexit could apply. Um, this means that it is important with EU-NATO cooperation, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, and that this is fed in and, and dealt with, uh, you know, creatively. I think that's important. We have the US, for instance, now announcing that they wanted to join a PESCO project on military mobility, which is important for the region. With the UK follow on that, uh, I think that's, you know, those kind of uh, ways working with the projects that we can are important and the whole hybrid uh, spectrum is very important also for the Baltic Sea region, this information, cyber and so on, uh, uh, where the UK uh, can bridge over through NATO. Uh, and then this, I think the last concern that I will mention, uh, which uh, relates to the overall questions here that Charles posed in the beginning, uh, you know, would the region be more dependent on London, you have the US where is the US heading more towards Asia? That's what we see. And what will this mean uh, for the region? And the concern is then, you know, will any of the <laughs> European great powers be able to help support and balance uh, the Russian threat so elegantly uh, elaborated upon here by, by Richard just previously? Is anyone up to the task? Uh, Germany, France, uh, the UK, not least. So uh, just to, to round up here, uh, is there a risk then that the UK withdraws from, from the Baltics? Um, I would agree with Maria. I don't think that uh, long term, uh, at least in the short term, I can't see that really. I would, uh, I, we had uh, Foreign Secretary Rab traveling to Estonia uh, today, I think, and uh, tomorrow moving on to Norway. Uh, the security threat posed by Russia being, uh, one of the main uh, themes for that. I think that's a strong signal. Next week we have the integrated review uh, uh, coming up and then the defense uh, white paper and I would expect all of them to, both of them to signal that uh, the UK will be strong uh, still with participation in Jeff and Horst forward presence and, and through NATO and so on still uh, engaged. Uh, I think it's clear that the UK cannot ex escape its geopolitical position, uh, even though you might uh, see more of global uh, ambitions ahead. It is, of course, by no means optimal that the UK is out of the EU. Uh, it complicates the matters uh, uh, to stay close. Uh, but a lot of the security concerns can also be dealt with in other frameworks. We mentioned the Northern Group. Uh, there are others. I think UK, Germany and France are working much more in the E3 format. That could be a potential for, for stepping up on a European pillar in NATO. Um, I was mentioning also EU NATO cooperation. Uh, and I think just to end from the UK perspective, I think it's wise to keep the Baltic Sea region uh, states close. Uh, also, because at those moments when the UK wants a seat at the table uh, with the EU, uh, it 
could be good to have other nations paving the way and, and uh, like-minded nations to, to push for also UK presence or consultations or, or coordination uh, where that is possible. And perhaps when Brexit is more mature, um, also more formal agreements on, on various parts, which will kind of settle, settle the scene more, more firmly as we move ahead. So I will round up there and look forward to questions and, and discussion. Thank you. Anna, thank you very, very much indeed for that. I'm sure all of you participating in this event would agree we've had three tremendous presentations from uh, our three panelists covering the issues in the round and a whole series of questions and discussions to have to take place. Um, I'm going to moderate the questions that come in. We've had seven contributions so far, and I'm firstly going to go to a question raised by Ian Bond, who's the Director of Policy at the Centre for European Reform, but also a former UK ambassador in Latvia. And what he has asked is, and I'm going to put it to the whole panel, but you'll hear from the question that he's targeting his questions to you slightly differently. He says, we're seeing lots of leaks of the UK's integrated defence and security review, which Anna referred to, due for publication next week, saying that the new priorities will be Asia plus cyber, space, etc., with big cuts in army. So his question to Richard is, do you, Richard, think this is going to be the outcome of the review? And if you do, do you think that's wise to cut the army in these circumstances? And to Anna and Maria, if the UK does reduce its commitment to the Baltic region, what would regional countries do to replace it is their question. So I'll go first to you, Richard, and then I'll go to Maria and then to Anna to give an answer to Ian's question. Um, well, thank you, Charles and Ian. Thank you for the question. I mean, the, the answer is that uh, I, I don't know what's going to be in the review uh, because I've not been part of it. And I also uh, I'm not going to be sitting on the sidelines and, and armchair generaling. I think it's up to today's generation to, to make do the estimate and, and come up with a plan to meet the requirement. Um, that, I mean, clearly, though, it, it whatever comes out of it has got to take account of cyber space. Um, we're, we're obviously seeing a lot of leaks about the Navy sending carrier battle groups off to the off to Asia and the like. Um, I would just you know, if I was sitting on the edge, I would just note a, a, a sound a note of caution to say that, yes, of course, we've got to be capable of operating in the asymmetric space, so cyber, uh, the manipulation of uh, countering, the manipulation of minorities, information operations, um, and the like, as we've seen deployed so effectively by Russia in the Crimea uh, some time ago now. Um, but at the same time, we've still got to be prepared, be prepared to fight uh, and be prepared to fight with conventional capabilities. Uh, and when you're fighting with conventional capabilities, you've got to be able to deploy firepower, you've got to need, you're going to need protection and you need mobility. The balance of that depends on the latest technology. Of course, you've got to bring that in. But there remain certain traditional technologies that I would expect to see in, uh, in both land, sea and air. So I think what the, the, the fundamental requirement is to ensure that the outcome of the review leaves us with credible and capable armed forces because we're going to need them. Thank you. Uh, Maria, uh, the question is, if the UK were to reduce its commitment to the Baltic region, what do you think regional countries would do to replace it or would they not replace it? Maria first. Thank you. Well, of course, it would uh, most uh, immediately affect in Estonia, where the UK's uh, footprint is currently the he heaviest. So the UK is the lead nation of the uh, of the enhanced uh, forward presence battle uh, battle group there. Now, of course, you know we already see that um, the the Baltic states are also not you know just sort of idly waiting. Estonia has been very much putting its eggs also on the French basket recently, which is in that sense something um, of a new development in many ways. Um, with with this um, pretty palpable you know for Estonia size contribution to the anti-terrorist operation in in Mali and and thereby collaborating with the French, so you know the French have been also part of this um, enhanced forward presence um, in uh, Estonia. I I wouldn't think there would be um, quite a full replacement, but I. 
I, I think we have to view this in the context of, of NATO and the scale of NATO, because there is a, a value of um, this presence, which only grows in time now for NATO as an alliance as well, to keep this up. And to, to, of course, NATO plays on the multinational card as being the great trump of this enhanced forward presence, which militarily, uh, Sir Richard might, might uh, uh, fill in there, might actually, of course, be more challenging than, than practically very, uh, very easy. But politically, uh, you know, the UK is not alone there. It is already multinational. Um, I'm, I'm sure there will be something uh, that can be uh, sort of capitalized on on the basis of these other relationships that are being cultivated by by the Baltic states. Thank you, Anna. Do you, would you like to add anything to what Maria has said, Anna, on this question? Well, I think we can just overall say that um, I think the region should be prepared to be more of a first responder, regardless of, of you know, and that would be one effect. Uh, if if uh, what Ian for uh, you know challenges with would happen, we can just we cannot just say that you know we would call Washington immediately if Britain withdraws. Uh, we would we would have to be able to be better to respond first. I think regardless of the output of the, of the integrated review, the land component from from British side, uh, we should think about that. Um, so, and on the other hand, you can say that perhaps the Jeff could be more of a first responder uh, on a regional sense and, and uh, help, help uh, while we see we can get the US response coming in. So this could work both ways. Uh, I wouldn't see that. I mean, that I could just imagine the UK being more in the North Atlantic and less in the Baltic Sea, perhaps in a very challenging situation uh, where you have uh, you know, the rise of China also in addition to, to an assertive Russia, perhaps. Um, so overall, I think we should think about it a bit more. I don't think we have any preparedness at the moment if it would, if it would happen. I don't think it's very likely, but still perhaps it's good to have a plan B. Well, that's an interesting set of responses to Ian's question. and. Uh, America has come in. I'm going to ask one of the questions which has been asked about the American attitude in just a second. But before I do, um, another important uh, uh, NATO ally around the Baltic is Poland. And Simon Boyd has asked the question, given Orban's plan for the extreme right to coalesce around his new Fidesz-led group, how far can the Baltic states rely on Poland? I think that's an interesting and challenging question going back to the politics of what's happening in Eastern and Central Europe. And I'm just going to ask Maria to comment on that, given her work on it. And then if either Richard or Anna likes to follow up, that's fine. But I'll then go on to a question about America. Maria, what do you think about Simon's question? This is a very good, good question and challenging indeed, because it, it brings us to the discussion of to what degree is geography a destiny and to, you know, at which point to diverging values, which aren't necessarily that diverging as, you know, the previous uh, government of Estonia also vividly proved, I think, in terms of certain leanings and certain, uh, certain uh, populist preferences, um, provide this cutoff point uh, between the allies that have been tied together by history and by, you know, their geopolitical uh, destiny, so to speak. I, I can't say that I have a very good answer to that. I think one would need uh, much more of the in-house diplomatic knowledge uh, to, to say something uh, significant there. I do remain pragmatist in that sense that geography tends to be one of these things that does not uh, change. Uh, the question of trust is the most difficult question in allied relationships and, and in, you know, building deterrence and and in also projecting deterrence i mean you know all i all i can say is that uh, i i saw uh, this question of trust being very much uh, raised in the context of um, you know to what degree uh, the uh, you know we can rely on the poles uh, in the former crisis before the ukrainian crisis that is the 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 war in, in Georgia, um, I, um, 
I, uh, I will not be able to, to say concretely what, what is happening in the sort of... Thank you, Maria. Uh, do either Richard or Anna want to say something about this question of Poland? Can I, can I add something, Charles? Yes, Richard. Uh, I mean, clearly, I, I, one doesn't know, but all I'd observe is that na clearly NATO is an alliance built on values of common values of, of, of democracy, liberty, uh, rule of law. Um, but NATO has faced challenges with, within its membership before. I mean, notably, of course, uh, the tensions between Turkey and Greece and the I'm, you know, don't forget, at one stage, Turkey was a military dictatorship, which, which is very much counter to the values I mentioned earlier. NATO has come through it because fundamentally NATO, the most successful alliance the world has seen over 70 years old, remains successful because all the nations within it recognize that they are militarily and politically stronger as a result of being uh, part of the alliance. Even the strongest nation, America, recognizes that. It's also a family. The NATO ambassadors live in Brussels, meet in Brussels uh, around the North Atlantic Council on a sort of two or three times a week. And, and so like in any family when there are, where there are tensions, um, you know, there are ways of getting over those tensions and difficulties. So I think NATO actually will remain strong despite the sort of political issues that, that, that the, the question um, implies. Okay. I'll ask Anna to deal with the next question first. If, you, if Anna, you want to add anything to this previous conversation, please do so. But the question of the role of the United States has run, run through this conversation. And Rachel Cunningham asks, for the young Americans listening today, I don't know if Rachel is herself a young American, would the speakers kindly share why they think the US is instrumental in the long-term viability of NATO and the disadvantages of having American input in NATO? She asked another question actually as well about the pertinent aspect of China's presence in Europe. Are the Jeff and NATO prepared to counter Chinese espionage and naval presence uh, elsewhere in Europe? So Anna, would you like to kick off in trying to address those uh, questions, but particularly the, Amer the American one? Uh, yes, so the role of, of the US in NATO, sorry, what was the question? The question is really how you see the future of the US position and uh, how the level of US commitment to NATO activity in the Baltic and whether you worry about any of those things. And she had a sub question about countering Chinese intervention in NATO and NATO institutions. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Rachel, for the question. Uh, I think those are very much interconnected and that's a big uh, debate now, um, which is connected to, to the changes in, in the global uh, power uh, levels and, and uh, the rise of, uh, or, uh, rise of rivals uh, and, and China, Russia. And I think the US, um, my understanding of the discussions I've had, I believe that the US will continue to be committed to European security and to use NATO also. Um, most things uh, point in that direction. But China is, of course, uh, entering the agenda in a way that it has not been, uh, in, you know, it's, it's new historically. It's, it's a strategic challenge uh, for NATO in a way that it has not uh, been before. And But there is still no uh, I wouldn't say preparedness within NATO or agreement within NATO on how to deal with this cha challenge. What will be the role of NATO or European allies in, in the big strategic uh, game uh, on China? That is still to be, I think, discussed and, and settled. Um, and we will see how this will play out, but it's a major, major theme for the coming decade. Thank you. Uh, Richard or Maria, would you like to add anything to Anna's answer? Maria, after you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll try to be brief this time. I mean, I do agree with uh, what, what Sir Richard said, that I think NATO, you know, is uh, very much still an American alliance in the sense that it's, it's nothing without American leadership. Um, maybe it's something, but, but it's not what it is. Uh, and, and I think with, with a change of cards in the US leadership, obviously, 
I, I don't see that uh, we have the you know politician who is a great uh, transatlanticist uh, and and uh, and the kind of a person who would start uh, you know thinking about spoiling something that is working actually. So so I think in that sense the future looks rather rather you know of the continuity kind rather than uh, the kind of disruption that we saw with President Trump. I think much of it, what you know, we are currently still processing is indeed the legacy of the Trump era in the sense that what kind of uh, damage it did to the, also the spirit of alliance and the paradoxes. I mean, you know, there was this, this uh, rhetoric that was hugely um, harming to the, um, you know, also the allied deterrent and yet, the developments on the ground were actually pretty positive when it came to you know building up the the deterrent in this vulnerable region so so there were contradictions there but one of these you know problematic legacies that i think has not left us and that we uh, have seen most palpably in poland is this idea of bilateralizing uh, further the relationship with the united states and maybe you know not necessarily doing it through through nato you know, the fourth trump idea playing on that card, which is off the agenda in this uh, form, of course, now. Thank you. I'm not, unless you've got something urgent to say, Richard, I'm going to go to another question. We're being flooded with questions, actually. Just, really just one, two, two very quick points. Number one, there are no disadvantages of having the US in NATO. NATO is dependent on a US political, diplomatic, and above all, military lead. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm going to take a slightly wider question that's come from Hans Wallmark, who's the, a member of the Swedish Parliament, Deputy Chairman of their Committee on Foreign Affairs. Very much welcome to this event, Hans. And he asks, other than saying great seminar, which I'll take as a good advertisement for us, is it possible to say something about the Arctic, the high north, which is of importance for Sweden, Norway, Denmark and Finland? Uh, it's not directly the centre of our conversations, but obviously it's a a uh, very important question that has to be considered when thinking about all this. Uh, Anna, is it fair for me to come first to you on this uh, uh, as the Swede in the room? And so I'll go first to Anna to say what you think about the Arctic and how we deal with that. And then I'll ask Maria or Richard if they've got anything further to say. Anna. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Hans, for, for joining us this evening. Great to have you with us. Uh, and the Arctic, I think, has risen in, in our conscious and, and uh, focus these past years. And a major point is that the military strategic area, which we first uh, agreed upon, is one in the Baltic Sea region, also connects very much to the Arctic and to the North Atlantic. So we need to see this in, in so say, one perspective. Uh, to a much larger extent than we have before. And the reasons for that uh, are that the Arctic is becoming part of the global uh, power competition uh, and tensions are rising there as well. Uh, and we again see the presence of China, for instance, not in military ways, but in economic ways, through research, uh, infrastructure investments and so on, uh, militarization from the Russian side, uh, and a newly awoken interest from the US to, to, to balance and to be more present in this region. UK, other ones are also uh, stepping up. Uh, so this area of, of Arctic exceptionalism, when there was no need to really focus on military issues, that is clearly, clearly over. And we need to have much more of a, a common and joint uh, assessment of the threats and challenges uh, from a broad perspective in the Arctic, uh, and I mean not only military movements, but also economic investments from China, for instance, in ports, um, mines, and so mining and so on. What does this mean for the security of Northern Europe? I think that's an important point. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Maria or Richard, anything you'd like to say on this subject? If, if I may, Charles, I, I mean, clearly the Arctic with climate change is increasingly going to be a, sea, a, a key sea line of communication. And therefore, uh, that is of direct relevance to not just to the Arctic nations of, of NATO, but also to the wider alliance, the transatlantic alliance. Um, and therefore, it will need to be thought about, or defence of those sea lines of communications will need to be thought about along with, um, with all other aspects of NATO defence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll come to you first on the next question, Maria, and if you want anything to add. This is from Oberon Ashbrook, 
who is a alumni of uh, Polis in Cambridge University and also the Estonian honorary consul in Jersey for the Channel Islands, a role I confess I didn't know existed. Uh, he says some mentions of the Russian speaking minorities of Estonia and Latvia. Is this a serious issue? And if so, do you have any policy suggestions for the Estonian and Latvian governments in relation to these minorities? Uh, I mean, I would say individually that I certainly think it's a very serious issue and it's an issue that does have to be thought about. And I also know that the Estonian and Latvian governments are thinking about it, but it's not straightforward. Maria, what would you like to say about this question? Thank you for the question. And um, well, what I can say, I would, uh, I would recommend first watching this film that we discussed last time, the World War Three Inside the War Room film, where Sir Richard has a significant part to play, which sort of, you know, contemplates the scenario, how could uh, these minorities become, you know, the issue. Of course, people never like to be thought about as as an issue this you know thinking of uh, the minorities the russian speaking minorities as potentially you know of security significance or or as a potential vulnerability in a crimea like scenario um, i don't think uh, it is in that sense an issue of an equal weight as it was uh, say in case of crimea i think these these contexts can't be compared so in that sense it's not a similar kind of an issue, but obviously it is an issue of making uh, the society living in Estonia and Latvia, you know, safe, attractive, and also sort of, you know, a, a, a pleasant experience for for these people, so that that uh, you know, via this this integration and and thereby societal resilience, you would control for the aforementioned vulnerability of them becoming somehow. Um, usable or, or instrumentalizable by, by somebody who would want to do that in an antagonistic manner. Thank you, Maria. Does Anna or Richard want to add anything on this answer? Um, no. if, again, at the risk of sort of having a say here, it, it's, it's clearly an internal matter, but, but the, the way the Russians operate, uh, and we, as we saw in the Crimea, has been part of that has been the manipulation of minorities. Um, and so that is, you know, clearly, as one said, and I said in my piece, there are significant uh, Russian speaking minorities, I have absolutely no doubt that the vast majority of them would much prefer to stay Latvian, Estonian, Lithuanian and citizens of the EU rather than citizens of Putin's Russia. But nevertheless, it is something it is a potential Achilles heel that I'm sure is being, you know, that, that all the Baltic states have got well under control. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. We've only got about three or four minutes left, and I, and I want to end promptly at six. So I'm just going to take a couple of the questions that have come in, and I apologise to those who I can't ask, and I'll take them together, and then ask each of the three panellists to conclude uh, with their perception on this. Firstly, from um, uh, James Oates, who's asked from the BCC in Tallinn, the core question he asks is, how much of a problem uh, is the Swedish and Finnish non-membership of NATO? Does this allow uh, Russian leverage and so on? Is that a problem or is it not a problem in reality? He acknowledges in his question the greater degree of joint work that's taking place, but is it a problem? Then the question from um, uh, uh, Jana uh, Vannemulder from Estonia. On the more active role of France in European defence after Brexit, which was referred to by Maria earlier on, President Macron is advocating a dialogue with Russia, including on discussing and reviewing American uh, European security architecture. How do you see this? Uh, could it be a problem? Is that a difficulty? Uh, and then finally, I'm going to ask what Elizabeth Bauer asked. I have there been a couple of questions on the UK EU relationship, which I haven't uh, had time to get in. But her question is, do you see that security policy, especially on the Baltic Sea region, the Arctic, could be one of the core topics where Great Britain and Europe will build up the basis for their future cooperation. So that's three rather different questions. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to respond, not necessarily to all of them, but to any question that you'd like to uh, deal with. And Richard, I'm going to ask you to kick off, please, and then I'll come to Maria, and then I'll ask Anna to conclude. So Richard, first of all. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, to the first question, uh, the problem is, is Sweden and Finland, or they, is it a problem that they're not part of NATO? Um, 
Yes, in a sense, it is a problem because they're not uh, members. They're therefore, uh, they're not covered by the Article 5 guarantee, collective defense. Um, but that said, we've got to be pragmatic. NATO is pragmatic. Finland and Sweden in many ways are more NATO than NATO. They have worked so closely with NATO allies in the Balkans, in Afghanistan. Um, they think absolutely along the same lines. Uh, and I'm sure those problems can be resolved, um, and, and particularly through organizations like the, uh, uh, the Joint Expeditionary Force. Secondly, the, the issue of France. All I'd say here is that the one thing Putin is brilliant at is dividing and ruling. Uh, and so if France continue clearly, dialogue with Russia is essential, as I said in my pitch, um, but, but all nations doing conducting dialogue with Russia should be very cognizant of the potential for, for, for divide and rule and being cleaved away from the central alliance, uh, from central alliance thinking. Uh, and, then, and then finally, absolutely, uh, the security policy could absolutely be a foundation stone uh, on which to build much closer cooperation between uh, the UK and the European Union, um, particularly as we witness the current teething problems of Brexit, which we hope will be resolved. Thank you very much, Richard. Maria, what are your comments on these three questions or whichever of them you like to choose? Well, it's tough to add uh, much uh, substance to what has, has been already said by, by Richard, but I, I would uh, second to that. Uh, I think, you know, Finland's and, and Swedish uh, membership in NATO in that sense, you know, if it would be preferable from, again, from, from NATO's perspective, it's not necessarily the kind of a like for like thing, nor is it without, again, political costs, because Russia is obviously very sensitive about, again, losing uh, thereby something that it uh, highly values, which is precisely this kind of a sense of a strategic buffer, as well as it would change fundamentally the, the balance on the Baltic Sea. That is clear as well. And Jana's question, um, and I'm here also glad to say hi to Jana, who was my mentor when I was a young student and, and interning at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, uh, I think this is a nice illustration of indeed the, the dangers of uh, taking uh, the idea of a dialogue uh, perhaps too uh, naively um, and, and, um, and too far uh, when, he, when we talk about Macron. I'll stop that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maria. Anna, what are your concluding thoughts? Well, I think, I mean, we welcome uh, French uh, increased interest in the Baltic Sea region. France is present there, it's good. Uh, and I think the idea of, of a dialogue with Russia, no one says that there shouldn't be dialogue with Russia and many countries have borders directly with Russia and have dialogue with Russia every day. But the way, uh, on a more strategic level, there has to be much more of, of also a movement within Russia and a will to cooperate and have a dialogue in a constructive way. And I think many of the countries which are close to Russia and in the Baltic Sea region, we don't see, see that movement uh, happening. And from that perspective, the Macron emphasis on dialogue uh, without any returns from Russia becomes uh, strange. And I also believe that we are the many countries are hesitant towards this call for a new security architecture. I believe many think that most countries think that the architecture that we have with the Health Defining Act and the OSCE principles and so on that works really well. And the problem is is more that Russia is not uh, complying with those uh, rules and that architecture uh, anymore. It should be, you know, br bring bring itself back into those cooperative uh, frameworks. Uh, and then I agree uh, with Richard on the UK, EU and the security policy. I really think that is a very strong uh, way that could be, uh, you know, move forward. And, and uh, to the extent that I don't think there is a political will for extensive agreements, but they could be a pragmatic approach uh, moving forward area from area and joining various projects and working with concrete uh, initiatives such as the GEF and move, move forward, definitely. Anna, thank you very, very much. Well, I'm sorry to say to all of you who've joined, we've now come to the end of the video panel on Britain on uh, Britain and the Baltic. Um, I think it's myself. It's been a tremendous discussion. I think there's been a lot of things said, a lot of information, a lot of engagement. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope you have too. I want to thank the panelists, all three of you, for the 
really insightful and clear contribution that you've made to the discussion this evening. It's really helped the whole thing go with a swing and it's tremendous. And I want to thank the audience too for coming. We've had some excellent participants from a wide range of different places, which has been, uh, I think, really valuable and strong. Uh, we will have future events, and I hope I could urge you, if you're not signed up to the regular mailing list, uh, please to join it to make sure you learn of future events that come along. Uh, and I want to remind you that you'll soon be able to find a recording of this event on the Centre for Geopolitics website. So thank you very, very much indeed for coming this evening. Thank you to everybody for making it happen. Uh, and good evening. Have a good evening drinking beer or whatever other activity you intend to engage in. Many thanks. Good night. <laughs>